Hi everyone, welcome back to the tutorial on video and language pre-training. I'm Rowe from Microsoft. Let's get started. Here's the outline of my talk. First, I want to highlight the importance of having large-scale data set in the era of video and language pre-training. This is followed by a method overview and taxonomy. Existing methods usually fall into two categories, reconstructive methods and contrastive methods, and we will have a deep dive on both. Next, I want to briefly talk about incorporating other modalities such as audio into our problem, and also a discussion on the relationship between image pre-training and the video pre-training. Finally, I want to introduce the downstream tasks and the benchmark results. And I will also have a shout out to a most, most recently proposed uh, benchmark for video and language evaluation called value. All right, let's dive in. Pre-training is a new. In fact, we have seen a rapid progress over the last decade on transfer learning in both a vision domain and language domain. So in the vision community, people have been using uh, pre-trained image classification models such as VGG and ResNet uh, for downstream tasks, uh, including object detection. And most recently in the language domain, people start to train large scale language models such as BERT and GPT-3 and transfer them for various downstream tasks. This has inspired a serious work at the intersection of image and language thanks to the availability of high quality data sets such as COCO and the conceptual captions. But there aren't as many work in the video domain. The reasons why the video and language field has been lagging behind is mainly due to two reasons. First, the challenge in harvesting large scale data set, and the second, the challenge in annotating those data. Here's a how the video and language data sets evolve over time. Over the last decades, as we can see, there's some progress uh, in the field in terms of uh, total video uh, duration. However, uh, even by the end of the early 2019, the largest public data set only has 600 hours worth of videos. As a comparison, 600 hours worth of videos are uploaded to YouTube alone every minute. So there's tremendous uh, amount of res uh, video resources remain untouched. The challenge lies in how to make use of those raw, uh, noisy data, and also what kind of annotations can we get besides videos themselves. The good news is recently uh, researchers proposed a way to leverage those uh, data effectively. Basically, they use the subtitles or automatically generated transcripts along with the video as a free form of annotations. For example, uh, if you have experience watching YouTube videos with closed captioning, uh, you probably know that there's an option to turn on the to turn on the transcript and within the transcript, um, each subtitle is localized in the video in terms of the start time step and end time step. So in, for example, here, uh, this subtitle starts at 11 minutes, 42 seconds, and ends at 11 minutes and 48 seconds. Now we have the paired video clips and the subtitles. We can use them as a form of supervision to train our multimodal systems. The reason is that the paired video clips and subtitles are usually correlated. So when, uh, whenever we are talking about something, we tend to demonstrate the concept or point to that objects uh, in the video. So the text can be grounded in the video. And the resulted data sets are much larger than the existing ones. For example, in how to 100 million, uh, it has uh, 1.2 million uh, instructional videos from YouTube, including over 100 million uh, pairs of video clips and associated subtitles. There are also other emerging public video and language datasets for pre-training, for example, TV dataset for TV shows and auto-captions on GIF dataset 
forgive on a variety of topics. So far, we have looked at the problem from a data perspective. Next, let's move on to the methodology. Here's a method overview. Back in 2019, there are only a few major players in the video and language pre-training business, such as Google and Inria. Since 2020, there are more and more major industry players, such as Microsoft and Facebook, and also academic players such as Carnegie Mellon and the University of Washington join the race. And we will give an overview on each of the methods here. And here is the taxonomy uh, of radio and language pre-training. There are two major bubbles here, reconstructive methods and contrastive methods. And within the reconstructive bubble, uh, there are some efforts using uh, generative objectives to learn radio representation. And so basically, uh, it's like a radio captioning task. So by generating the caption uh, perfectly, uh, we require the model to have a good radio representation. And on the other side of the chart, uh, within contrastive learning, uh, contrastive methods, uh, there are also some efforts uh, incorporating other modalities such as audio to the problem. And we will also have an overview on those methods. Okay, for reconstructive methods, they are usually based on BERT. And so we will have a brief introduction next on BERT. And those methods usually adopt uh, the early fusion architecture. So if you look at the diagram, uh, so given a paired video clip and the tags, what we do is, uh, so we first pass the video through a video encoder, such as i3D and the SlowFast, to get the video feature. And once we have the video feature, we fit it along with the tags into our multimodal encoder, and usually um, a pre-trained bird. So um, in, in this architecture, the video feature and the tags are interacting with each other at the very early stage of the model. That's why we call it early fusion architecture. And so for, for reconstructing methods, they usually leverage pre-trained unimodal features or backbone, like we mentioned. And the image counterparts are VLBERT, uh, VLP, Uniter, and OSCA. So you, you probably have already been familiar with this uh, if you attend the early talks. Here are some background on BERT. Uh, BERT stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers and they use um, unsurpassed objectives to learn a good uh, word and sentence representation. There are two training objectives in BERT. The first one is called Masked Language Modeling, or MLM. So basically, uh, by reconstructing a corrupted sentence, we want the model to learn a contextualized representation. So in this example, we mask out word of number four and ask the model to reconstruct it based on its context. The second objective is called the next sentence prediction or NSP. So we basically put up uh, two sentences together and then let the model decide uh, if those two sentences are coherent or not. So by predicting the next sentence, the, method, the model can pick up uh, the semantic structures that uh, is essential for uh, language modeling. All right, so here comes the, the first work in the, the reconstructive methods. And um, Radio Bird is perhaps the most straightforward extension of Bird to, the, to the, our problem. And it uses uh, three, over 300K cooking videos from YouTube uh, for the pre-training. And the video feature is the Kinetics pre-trained S3D. And so in order to fit into the BERT uh, paradigm, so Radio BERT proposed to, uh, you know, like because we need to fit tokens into the model, so Radio BERT proposed to uh, tokenize those radio features through hierarchical k-means. And the multimodal encoder uh, in Radio BERT is a BERT large model. And the objectives uh, used in Radio BERT include uh, standard ones such as mask language modeling for for language modeling and must frame modeling, which is the vision counterpart of the MLM objective. 
So basically, we must out a few uh, frames in the input and ask the model to reconstruct them at the output. And the third objective is called the video text matching. So it's similar to the next sentence prediction objective in BERT, uh, but it's applied to a paired uh, video clip and the subtitle. So we want to make sure, um, um, so subtitles, paired subtitle and clips are close to each other in the embedding space, and uh, unpaired ones are farther away from in, in the embedding space. And the important message from video BERT is that adding more data generally gives better results. So if you look at uh, the X axis of this chart, um, this is the pre-training data site. So uh, it has uh, at most uh, 300K data points and the model has not, the performance has, hasn't saturated yet. So it's natural to think about uh, what will happen next if we have more data. And that's exactly what people did later on. So Act Bird is a follow-up work on Video Bird, and is pretrained on How to 100 Million, which is much larger than the dataset used in Video Bird. And for feature, uh, video feature extraction, it uses uh, the faster RCNN to extract object region features, and for frame level feature, it uses uh, kinetics pretrained R2 plus 1D. And the multimodal encoder is again a bird. Training objectives act bird uh, use standard ones such as mask language modeling and the video text matching. And on top of that, you propose two new objectives, uh, master object classification and master action classification. So basically they got the object labels from a detector and the action labels from the text and then as the model to predict actions on the objects um, on must clips and the regions. So it's similar to must language modeling, but to predict object labels and action labels. The next one is called Hero, and it adapts a similar uh, standard objectives such as MLM and MFM. And it also proposed two new objectives. The first one is called the video subtitle matching or VSM. So basic, basically the idea is take a subtitle, we want to localize it in a, in a long video, in a full video in terms of the start time step and the end time step. So by doing this grounding process, uh, the model can pick up the, um, the correspondence between different modalities and help it to enhance the representation for each modality. The second objective it proposed is frame order modeling. So basically we scramble the, the frames in the video and ask the model to reorder those frames. So by doing so, the model can learn how, how does temporal dynamics work uh, between frames. And the last piece of work is called Decembered, um, which stands for dense captions and entropy minimization. There are two main technical contributions here. So the first one is they propose to fit uh, dense captions along with the video and subtitles into the model. So you can find an example on dense captioning on the, the right hand side. So in this figure, given this uh, cat image, the dense captioning model can generate localized descriptions as follows and, to, and um, so describe the image. And then, so in this paper, December uh, leverage those dense captions and feed them into the multimodal encoder. So this is the first contribution. And the second contribution is, um, um, is called attention entropy minimization. So in order to understand this, we need to have some context on the misalignment issue between a uh, video clip and subtitle. So we talked about paired uh, video clip and subtitle earlier. Um, so there are some scenarios when the clip and subtitles are not exactly correlated. So uh, especially in instructional videos, when someone talk about something, some object, uh, they tend to uh, demonstrate it uh, not immediately. So there might be some delay uh, in the demonstration. And this results in the misalignment problem between the two. 
And in order to solve this, this method proposed to fit uh, multiple neighboring uh, subtitles of the video into the multimodal encoder and then let the video learn how to attend to and which one which one should should attend to uh, by itself. All right, that concludes the reconstructive methods. And now let's move on to the constructive learning uh, based methods. So if you are familiar with uh, uh, recent advances in uh, image based contrastive learning, so it works such as uh, SimClear. You probably hope won't have proper understanding this uh, concept. So basically uh, we take um, um, a data sample and then generate different views for this data sample. So in our case, uh, different views could be uh, the videos, the text, or sometimes the audio, right? And once we have those different views from the same data sample, uh, we try to you know, minimize their distance in the embedding space and then um, maximize the distance between uh, this sample and other samples uh, in the mini batch. And as depicted in this uh, GIF on the right hand side. And we will cover, uh, we will have a more detailed uh, background introduction uh, in the next few slides. And so uh, contracting methods uh, usually adopt a late fusion architecture. And so given a pair of video and text um, data, uh, we feed them into uh, the video encoder and text encoder uh, individually. And once we have the feature, uh, we use a uh, uh, contractive loss to uh, decide their uh, distance in the embedding space. And this kind of framework is usually trained from scratch. And so the, the, the weights from the two encoders are usually random initialized. And the image counterparts for construction methods uh, are a clip. All right, so here are some background on contrastive learning. So given a data point X, contrastive methods aim to learn an encoder F such that um, for data sample that is similar to a uh, data point X, we want them to look also, also look similar in the embedding space. And for data samples that are dissimilar to data point X, we want them to be farther apart in the embedding space. So to put a context uh, in this uh, diagram, uh, we want the positive samples to be as close to X as possible and negative samples to be far away. And the scoring function S could simply be a vector uh, in a product or cosine similarity. And most of the work until now is on how to define the positive and negative samples. And based on the objective function, contrasting methods fall into three categories. The first one uses uh, logistic loss, and which is used in the, the VTM video text matching objective we mentioned earlier, and also the next sentence prediction objective invert. Uh, basically, we um, we regress the the similarity between positive pairs to be one and the, between uh, negative pairs to be zero. And the next one is margin loss, and we will see th this later in the talk. And so, the basically we want to minimize the total hinge loss between the negative pairs and the positive pairs. And the third one, perhaps the most popular one, is the noise contrastive estimation loss or NCE loss. And you will be seeing this a lot uh, in, the, in the following uh, slides. Uh, so um, if you think about it, so for the first two losses, uh, we are we need to decide what which one is negative pair. So we usually people figure out different uh, strategies like to mine to mine those negative samples, but that could be uh, non-trivial sometimes. And so in uh, NCE loss, uh, instead of picking one, so they are using all other samples from the mini batch as negative samples, and then apply a cross entropy loss on the N way softmax classifier. So you, you will see a, a formulation similar to what you see from image classification. So at the top, the numerator, uh, we want to make it as large as possible. And so we want to make the similarity between positive pairs to be large and at the same time suppress the similarity between negative pairs. All right, so inspired by this framework, 
here comes the first uh, work in the lineup of contrasting methods. So it's called the Contrasting Bidirectional Transformer or CBT. And so let's fo focus on the first the first half of the diagram. So the, the later part, the second half uh, is for uh, downstream tasks, which we will introduce uh, in later of the talk. So for the upper part, uh, the pre-training part, uh, basically there are two uh, components. And so for the this part, for the, the one in black, so this one only takes in videos and essentially learns representation from video itself. And this one highlighted by red, uh, this is a, a multimodal branch. So they it takes in a video representation, video representation and the text representation and try to um, decide how how far they should be in the embedded space. And uh, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, the two objectives, one is on video and one is on video and language. Uh, the first one we can call it video NCE, and the second one uh, video language NCE, or short as uh, VL uh, NCE. VL NCE is very relatively simple to understand. So any paired uh, clip and subtitle are considered a positive pair, and the rest of the uh, the the clips and subtitles in the mini batch are negatives. But how does the video NCE work? So here is the illustration. And so I will put it in this way. So given a video, uh, we, we can find many clips from the video and the extract the feature with a uh, um, 3D convolution network. And so once we have the rep feature representation, so we want to do something similar to BERT here. And so uh, following the, the idea uh, concept in BERT, what we can do here is we can mask out one of the feature and predict it at the end, uh, use the context uh, context information. So just uh, similar to BERT. And so by uh, leveraging the context uh, features, we can learn um, how, how, does a how does a video representation work. And so the, the end goal is to uh, make uh, the prediction, the, the corrupted pr prediction on the corrupted input to be as close to the feature original feature as possible. And a similar objective is used in Hero. So the M must frame modeling uh, loss uh, with the uh, NCE. All right, the second word in this lineup is uh, MLL um, NCE. And uh, it also used the VL NCE loss, but with the twist on multiple instance learning. So we talk about the misalignment issue between uh, video clips and subtitles. So basically what they are doing is, here is they fit in uh, multiple um, uh, neighboring subtitles associated with the video to the model. So as long as one of the subtitle matches with the video, the loss will not be too high. So this is the overall concept. The next one is called a SCOOT and stands for Cooperative Hierarchical Transformer. And it, has two contributions. So the first one is they apply a uh, margin loss on uh, which we talked about earlier uh, to uh, clips and also to uh, uh, different videos. So to clip, uh, so this the first part is easy to understand. So it's similar to what we have for uh, VL and CE loss. But for the video level, what they did is they aggregate uh, clips from uh, each video, aggregate the features from each video and to represent, uh, to use it as a representation for the video uh, itself. And then they can apply the same uh, constructive, contrastive loss between the videos. Second contribution is called a uh, uh, cross modality cycle consistency loss. Uh, so starting from, um, so if you look at the diagram here, uh, the, which uh, the first row uh, correspond to the video clips and the second row correspond to um, um, subtitles, uh, subt captions for each clip. So what they did here is, uh, so they start from a sentence as I and they find the nearest neighbor in the clip sequence. So they go to go from text to, to vision and then come go back, go back to text. So they find the nearest neighbor um, in the text again. So by doing so, uh, they can 
minimize the de de deviation between the star index and the in N index. So make sure uh, the model can learn a good correspondence between the two modalities in an unsupervised way. All right, the next one is called MERLOT and uh, it adopts um, standard objectives such as MLM and VLNCE and the temporal reordering. So similar to what we have discussed earlier and uh, is one of the uh, few works that uh, propose to combine reconstructive objective and constructive objective. All right, moving on to the generative methods. Uh, those methods are usually inspired by video captioning. So given a video, if we can perfectly uh, generate its description, then we can uh, get, we can um, competently say that we got a good video representation. So this is the uh, motivation of this line of work. And they usually adopt an encoder-decoder architecture. And so the image counterpart for uh, generative methods uh, is a, a vertex. And the first work in this lineup is UniVL, and it, it uses uh, four standard objectives along with uh, the language reconstructive uh, objective. So basically, they add a decoder uh, to the encoder such that uh, you can uh, generate, uh, reconstruct the, the sentence and use that you, and backpropagate the, the arrow to the input to, to refine the, the video encoder and the text encoder. The second work is called a support set bottlenecks, SSB. So this work is quite interesting in terms of the motivation. So they noticed that uh, VLNCE loss uh, pushes away even semantically related captions. So if you look at the um, chart, uh, the diagram A here, so given uh, a pair of data like this, so this is our target uh, video clip and target subtitle. And so when what constructive learning would do is, so it uh, it repels all other samples in the mini batch. So even though putting the shots and also harming ball are right, really similar to the text throwing the ball, it will still be pushed away um, according to the contrastive objective, which is uh, not ideal. Um, and so what the paper does is it introduced something called cross captioning, which alleviates this issue by reconstruct a sample's text representation as a weighted combination of a support set. So the support set here means uh, uh, every other sample in the mini batch other than the positive sample. So um, basically all the uh, other negative samples considered in constructive learning. And if we look at take a closer look at the at the the, the chart the diagram here, um, so for the the green one and the the orange one, so they are visually similar to uh, our positive samples. So the what the paper the paper does is it uses uh, the support set, so it uh, turns on those samples from the support set and generate. Uh, text uh, using a text decoder and try to minimize the distance between the generated text and the target text uh, so that if uh, the in the support set a sample is closer to our target video then it can be uh, pulling together uh, in this in the embedding space all right so here that's a general concept and our next work uh, is not associated with the, any of the method, but it's more like a general way to close the source target domain gap. And it's called a qubit, uh, stands for adaptive curation of pre-training data. And so what it does is, so it finds, given a downstream task, downstream data, it finds a data similar to in the, in the pre-training data and uh, in order to um, to close, uh, to, to make sure that there isn't a salient domain gap between the pre-training and the downstream task. And it has been uh, successfully applied to various models, including MILNCE, Hero, Clip, and the VLP. All right, uh, so far we have looked at uh, video, uh, the problem from video language perspective, so two modalities. And there's some recent work exploring adding more modalities to the equation. So for example, audio. And we will have a brief overview here. 
The first one is called Multimodal Versatile Network, or MMV. Uh, they basically explore different uh, topologies to align the three modalities. And what they end up getting is, um, uh, if we align audio and video first, and then text, we will get the best performance. The second work is called VATT. It essentially uh, incorporate visual transformers, or VIT, into the first model, in the first work. And now we can fit in a raw image pixels and the raw audio waveform into a joint encoder uh, instead of using a modality specific encoder. The third work is slightly different from the first two. So it adopts a constructive uh, objective, and at the same time, it, uh, it does a clustering on the embedding space. And through the clustering, we can get some pseudo labels. And um, with these pseudo labels, we can train, apply some supervised uh, objective to each modality for uh, representation learning. And there are some other works, um, including uh, multimodal transformers that leverage more uh, modalities and also um, a line of work on video and audio um, that uh, does look deeper into the, the relationship between these two modalities. And so we, we encourage you to uh, have some further readings on those topics. All right, the next thing I want to discuss is the relationship between image pre-training and the video pre-training. So you might wonder uh, with all those wonderful uh, image pre-trained models such as Clip out there, why do we want to bother with um, more computational heavy video pre-training? So the answer is that uh, video pre-trained models can also do well on image tasks and it can benefit uh, image learning. So we have seen results uh, from MMV and VAIT on uh, ImageNet classification, and uh, the results are quite decent. And also Merla showed uh, results on image question answering uh, on the VCR data set, and uh, the, the results are also really impressive. And also, there's a work to end the debate by jointly trained uh, the video and the image encoder. And uh, yeah, I will also encourage you to read this paper. So on the other hand, can image pre-training benefit video tasks? So the answer is also yes. And we have seen that on clip. And uh, so they show results on uh, various action recognition data sets. And more recently, uh, clip bird. The, which basically the idea is um, they, instead of doing heavy video language pre-training, they perform a simple, more lightweighted uh, image text pre-training and transfer it for various downstream video tasks. Here's a summary of the methods we covered today. In the first block, these are reconstructive methods because they adapt uh, MLM objective as the main objective. Note that they, all of them also adapt the video text matching objective, which is kind of a contrastive objective. And the reason why we classify them as reconstructive methods is because uh, the mask language modeling objective is still the dominating one in those methods. Second block uh, represents the contrastive methods. And the last one is a mixture of different objectives, including reconstructive, contrastive, and sometimes generative. All right, so here comes the downstream tasks and the benchmark results. And there are two main categories. So there are video-only tasks, such as action recognition and uh, or video language tasks, which I will cover in the next slide. For video-only tasks, uh, action recognition aims to classify a input video uh, into action label. And for action segmentation and localization, uh, it uh, takes in a query, action query, and try to localize it in the long video. So for the sake of time, I will focus on the results on action recognition. And for video language tasks, 
Um, there are three mainstream uh, tasks. Um, first, captioning, which generate a descriptive sentence for input value, and retrieval, uh, which uh, given a query sentence, it finds uh, the most similar, most related video from a candidate pool. And last, uh, the question answering. So given a question associated with the video, we want to answer the question in natural language. And we will look at all three uh, tasks. For action recognition, we show results on HMDB 51 and UCF 101. And here are some key takeaways. If we compare the result uh, from multimodal pre-training with the pure vision-based self-supervised learning, we see uh, multimodal pre-training has an edge. But when it comes to supervised method, uh, self-supervised methods still are training behind. So you can see there's a gap between the multimodal training and the supervised approach. And when it comes to captioning uh, on UCO2, we have seen a pro really re uh, regressive progress um, as thanks to uh, pre-training. And on retrieval, we have seen a similar progress. And what's interesting is that uh, even without fine tune on the downstream task, so the downstream data set, so in this correspond to the zero shot setting, uh, the portrait models can already perform well, which indicate that uh, those models can generalize well to similar domains. And uh, the full results, uh, again, pre-training uh, has a um, huge advantage over non pre training based methods. Another retrieval data set, uh, uh, which is MSR VTT, uh, we see similar conclusion here, and but the improvement is, uh, is uh, smaller. So the gap um, is narrower, narrower compared to you could do. And this is possibly due to uh, the domain discrepancy. So um, how to 100 millions has all uh, how to videos and the MSR VGT uh, have general videos from different domains. And on question answering, uh, what we have seen is uh, the most recent method um, called Merlot uh, outperform uh, all existing methods, uh, sometimes by a really large margin on TVQA. So the takeaway here is um, the data used in this work is much larger than how to 100 million, and it contains uh, diverse topics, uh, including TV, uh, movie, those entertainment content. And so this allows us to go beyond literal descriptions. So those uh, you, we usually see in instructional videos. So when we talk about something, we, are us we usually demonstrate those uh, uh, concepts and uh, show those objects. So those are literal descriptions. And in this data set, they also uh, include data that contain more common sense knowledge and which later benefit the QA downstream tasks. All right, last but not least, I want to shout out to a recently proposed uh, video and language evaluation benchmark called VALUE. So it covers uh, div a diverse uh, tasks uh, from retrieval, QA to captioning, and it also covers a uh, diverse topics. So you, the data comes from uh, 11 different data sets and covering uh, TV, how to movie, vlog, cooking and activity content. And the value uh, leaderboard comes with the competition that will be held at ICCV 2021. And I will encourage you guys to check it out with this QR code. To conclude, uh, video and language pre-training is still at its very early stage. And there are some limitations with the current uh, evaluation uh, pipeline. So basically different methods tend to use different modality, maybe different pre-training data set, architecture, and pre-training strategies itself. Uh, and so uh, it makes it really difficult to have a fair comparisons between those methods. And the more unified benchmark such as value uh, should be proposed. And there are also a few other directions we can take on next. Uh, for example, scaling up the data set and make it more diverse and also um, 
um, multimodal using other modalities and uh, also let this technique benefit different languages. That's all for my talk. Thank you so much for your attention.